Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our first installment of the Tory Botanical Society's Fall 2022 Lecture Series. My name is Lydia Paradiso, and I'm a Tory Council member as well as a PhD student at the New York Botanical Garden. Since the Society's founding back in 1867, one of our main activities has been to host lectures on various topics of botanical research. We have a great slate of talks scheduled over the next few months, uh, and you can see what's coming up uh, by visiting our website which I just linked in the chat. The best way to stay updated on our future lectures as well as field trips and other events is by becoming a member of the society. But you can also follow us on social media, specifically on Facebook and Twitter. So for tonight's talk, uh, we have uh, Bethany Zumwaldi here, who is a PhD student at the University of Florida. She will speak to us tonight about the cytogeographic, morphological, and genetic variation of the multiple cytotype cactus, Cylindropintia lepticollis. Bethany earned her undergraduate degree from Wright State University in Ohio and her master's from Ohio State University. Before going back for a PhD, she worked in two different positions, serving as a lab manager and research assistant at the Desert Botanical Garden in Phoenix, Arizona, and at the Morton Arboretum near Chicago, Illinois. In these positions, she primarily assisted with conservation genetics research projects pertaining to various endangered cactus and tree species. Bethany is currently a fourth year PhD candidate within the Florida Museum of Natural History and the Department of Biology at the University of Florida. Her dissertation involves how, investigates how polypoidy, i.e. whole genome duplication events, has contributed to the shaping of diversity within cactaceae. In 2021, Bethany was one of the recipients of the Tory Society's Graduate Student Research Fellowship Awards, uh, which contributed to the research that she will talk to us today. So before I turn it over to Bethany, just a few quick notes about the Zoom. Um, you're free to have your video on or off during the talk, but please make sure you keep your mic muted so that we don't um, interrupt. Uh, feel free to enter any comments or questions in the chat as we go. And at the end, uh, I will read out some of those questions from the chat. Uh, or if you'd like to verbally ask the question, uh, you can use the raise hand feature and uh, we'll make sure that you get an opportunity to ask your question. And now I'll hand it over to Bethany. Thank you so much for that awesome introduction, Lydia. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Okay. Hopefully you can see everything. Is it all good? Yep. Awesome. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm extremely excited to present on the research that the Tory Botanic uh, Society, you know, funded for part of this. It's been a whirlwind during the pandemic trying to complete this dissertation and this research project. So a lot of what I'm going to present on today is in progress research. Um, but I think it's gonna be some really great stories here. So again, my talk is gonna be focusing on investigating the cytogeographic, morphological, and genetic variation of this multiple cytotype cactus, uh, Cylindropuntia lepticollis, also known as Christmas Choya, um, if you're more familiar for that common name. Um, and then you can kind of see here, hopefully with my cursor, that red fruit, which gives it its common name, which I think is actually getting stuck. Ah, okay. Um, ah, sorry about that. Um, okay, so again, I just want to emphasize thank you to the Tory Botanical Society. And then um, again, PhD candidate at the University of Florida. And then you can find my contact info here if you need me on Twitter, it's just at Bethany Zimaldi. Uh, and then my email is here too, which I believe they, um, they can share at the end. So I'm gonna go ahead and dive in here. Um, so I realize that a lot of people might not be familiar with polyploidy and what it actually means. So I really wanna start off this talk um, by telling you that this is having more than two sets of chromosomes. So this whole genome duplication event is essentially a mutation um, that results in having more than two sets of chromosomes to say the least. And this can develop, um, really affect developmental processes, gene regulation, and then really cause shifts in morphology, physiology, ecological breath. And that's just really to name a few. Um, so this is a major process that can affect 
speciation mechanisms um, and these cacti. And so cacti in general, um, as a group here, so we estimate that there are roughly 1,850 species of cacti. They're perennial, generally long-lived species. Um, they're highly clinal in some clades, such as the Puntioide, um, which I'm gonna talk about today. And I think that clonality is really gonna be an important investigation in this work uh, later on. Um, they also have a diversity in breeding systems and floral morphology. Um, and they also have high diversification rates in response to um, this increase of arid niche space in the late Miocene. So this um, polyploidy event here, so it's labeled paleopolyploidy. So this ancient whole genome duplication event um, in the order that cacti belong in, Caryophyllis here, um, there's no evidence in the most recent common ancestor of paleopolyploidy event. So we are assuming that in my talk today that much of the um, polyploidy or whole genome duplication events are occurring really either at the species or genus level um, of this group. And so it's really affecting conservation um, strategies. It's affecting how we are defining species, how we're defining populations. Um, it's a really important process that we need to be aware of. And so poly, uh, polyploidy quantified in a puntioidy, so where cylinder puntia punt, uh, leptocolis is, um, it has been previously identified um, as being 60% polyploidy in this clade. There's been a lot of research coming out in the last few years trying to really quantify how much polyploidy is occurring across cactaceae and cacti alone. Um, but I'm gonna use this 60% estimate, which is generally high in plants. So if you're not familiar with this process, we kind of go along with 35, 30% of all land plants um, might be derivatives of polyploids. So it's a really important process just to completely reemphasize that um, going forward. So in particular, moving from um, cacti in general to the study system. Uh, Cylindra puntia leptocollis, the shrubby cactus, generally about a half a meter to two meters tall. Um, it is the most widespread choya, so it's common name of choya um, in North America. So you can see here, I have the distribution map in the top right hand um, corner. This is using GBIF, iNaturalist, any current data I can find on the species. So you can kind of see it um, here. I'm gonna define this region as the Great Plains. We have the Chihuahuan Desert blending in here. Um, it bows in and then anything on this Western side, I'm gonna just call Snorn Desert for the future. And so this is occupying a giant <laughs> niche space of deserts, grassland, chaparral, woodlands. Um, and I also want to note that this taxon, in particular, is sister to all other what we consider choya species or Selenoprinta. It hybridizes frequently with at least nine other species um, within that group. And the really cool thing that I want to emphasize is that um, there's multiple cytotypes. So we have diploids having two genomes, uh, triploids having three, and then tetraploids having four represented in this group. And so the key um, aspect of this research in particular that um, is really cool, hasn't been done before, is that it, this is gonna be a fine scale study of cylinder puntia leptocollis. Um, within cactaceae, fine scale studies are somewhat uncommon, but especially, are especially in a puntioide. So in this talk in particular, I'm gonna focus on cytogeographic, so the distribution of ploidy levels. We're also gonna briefly talk about the work that I've been doing with an undergraduate, Raquel Garcia, on the morphology. Um, I'm also gonna briefly talk about my previous work with the ecological breadth and then preliminary data um, on the population genetics of the species. And so a majority of this talk is really gonna be emphasizing on that um, variety of ploidy level um, and that's distribution of cytotypes what I'm calling cytogeography. And in particular, cytogenetics has been really useful um, for species delimitations in cactaceae. 
possible uh, cryptic species within morphologically similar and also recently diverging groups um, has been noted as a really key mechanism of speciation. So we should be particularly aware of species that we're defining with multiple cytotypes. Should we be calling these different species? Do they interbreed? Are they reproductively isolated? These are kind of the common questions that we should be thinking about and when we're estimating how many species are within a group and what we should conserve, for example, in the applied sense. Um, there's been several uh, cytogeographic studies of choyas, but they're very broad. There's really no studies prior to this that are really looking at the population level, um, which I'm particularly interested in. So we want to know, let's see, the research question here is, what is the pattern of cytotype distribution of cytotype or of, uh, cylinder elliptocollis? And so I'm mainly going to go over the results from the chromosome counts. Um, but I also have a little bit of preliminary data on using flow cytometry. So chromosome counts are a direct measure um, of ploidy, whereas we can use a flow cytometer to estimate uh, genome size for these species or these cytotypes. Um, I also really want to emphasize that again, so I have a map here showing the previous knowledge prior to my dissertation. Um, of what we knew about the cytotype distribution. So this is from Mark Baker. Um, and so I have in purple here, the purple diamonds is diploids. You have your squares as triploids and then your circle in blues um, as your tetraploids. And then we can see here, anything that's a small gray circle is our undetermined or to be determined um, ploidy level. So we have a pretty great grasp, or Mark had a pretty great grasp, I should say, of what's happening here um, at the Sonoran Desert. And then generally, we're lacking a lot of information about the Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert. I will emphasize that most of my dissertation has been limited um, by collecting data that is within um, the United States. So collecting data within Mexico has been somewhat difficult. So any data I show you today is strictly within the United States. Um, and then I also want to emphasize um, that, well, I guess that's what I want to emphasize. I'll just leave it there for now. There have been several complications to this dissertation um, in which Tori has been particularly helpful especially with funding with. There were a lot of unforeseen aspects of what the pandemic was gonna do to this work. So I had to figure out a way during my first field season to go out and um, in 2020, mainly focus on collecting information on Texas populations. So the previous work, um, basically what Mark did was take one individual per population. So it was not at a population level, it's a very broad sense of what's happening um, in the species. What the pandemic uh, kind of did was <laughs> restrict us to Texas for the time being. Um, basically, my colleague and I, Emma Spence, went out to Texas, traveled all along to as many populations as we could. Um, and then I had to keep a lot of that on my porch due to university restrictions on accessing greenhouse um, space at that time. So essentially I was trying to grow out roots for chromosome tips to get these uh, mitotic counts, um, which involved, for example, setting up a microscope in my house and just trying to get as much data as I possibly could during this time while we couldn't access the university. Um, obviously my dogs are very compliant in that um, sense, but it was, a uh, quite an interesting two field seasons going through uh, what we could to get permission to sample. And so what I suspect you're most interested in is the current status of this project. So there's been two field seasons and for most populations, or at least I should say many populations have um, gained at least one individual chromosome count. So a direct count of what the ploidy is. So I have a GIF here playing on your right. It's gonna circle back through 
but it'll start at the beginning where we knew nothing about, um, well, or very little about the uh, cytotype distribution of the species and how it's progressed, um, whether that's based on sample collection and all the chromosome counts. I've also noted here, um, we've collected plants from about over 200 specimens. So um, some of these points here represent population level sampling and some of them strictly are just collecting one plant um, to try and gain an idea of what the cytotype distribution is broadly. So we went out, we collected plants for the greenhouse. Um, we also collected every individual on silica for DNA extraction later on in case we need it. Um, at this point in time, I've developed a cyto, uh, flow cytometry protocol uh, with the issue being that that has been down for the last three months. So really I'm relying on my direct uh, microscope work at this point to gain the data that I need. But with that preliminary data, luckily we have the <laughs> We have some initial data here. So in purple, I have what I have um, already previously counted as 2x. In the orange, that's what I previously had uh, direct measures of as your 3x or triploids. And then your purple, or sorry, your blue here is your tetraploids and 4x. So you can see here with the flow cytometry, this indirect measure where we're staining the nuclei and running in through the machine we don't have this direct break with the current machine that I'm using. So there might be some issues here delimiting what's a diploid and what's a triploid. And all I wanna say about that is really that the chromosome counts are gonna be our best reliable measure here. Um, unfortunately, with the greenhouse plants, which generally with flow cytometry, you wanna have live material of, like uh, these live nuclei. The issue being that Scale, for any of you who have worked with cacti, um, can really decimate your collections. So we've had some casualties and we might need to rely on silica dried material um, for this flow cytometry. So for right now, we have promising results, um, but take this preliminary data with a grain of salt, I suppose is where I'll leave that. Morphology. So the next really important part um, of this research is the question of, can we gain anything from morphology? Do cytotypes have different morphology? Do the diploids look different than triploids, for example, or tetraploids? Um, and what we really need is to gain as much knowledge as we can across the geographic breadth of the species. And, we wanna know, are there any morphological traits associated with ecological breadth um, or morphology? Can we go up to a plant and say, this is a diploid or this is a tetraploid? Especially if we're thinking about species boundaries, right? And we're thinking about conservation. Should we treat these possibly reproductively isolated entities as different species? Well, if we do that, can people go into the field and just directly identify them? This is really important um, to on the ground conservation workers, right? If we're gonna say something is uh, or worth conserving, I guess. Um, so the original plan was to do these NC2 measurements on the cacti um, and also looking at stromatal differences. So I'm first gonna talk about these NC2 measurements here. So in Cactaceae in particular, um, this allopolyploidy, so allopolyploidy is when two plants hybridize and then the genome duplicates. So we have two different genomes represented at least um, in this entity here. This can result in intermediate morphological characteristics um, of the putative parent. So for example, we've seen allopolyploids have differences in flower color, flower size, fruit shape, fruit texture, spine attributes. Um, sometimes they're intermediate, sometimes one parent will um, dominate the morphology. It's somewhat difficult to tell. With autopolyploids, however, there's noticeable differences, but um, when you have an autopolyploid, so this is when the genome of one 
species is duplicated. So you have two copies of that same species represented in the genome. Um, what we hope here, I guess let's just say not noticeable differences. I'm not sure how that um, got mixed up, but oftentimes we see larger uh, morphological differences um, or larger characters, I should say, but they will generally blend. So if you have an auto polyploid and you walk up to it, it will look like a diploid um, parent to say the least. So it's really difficult to distinguish diploids from their polyploid uh, parents. In the genus Cylindroprintia, uh, morphology has been really useful to distinguish hybrids, especially when we're looking at um, flowers. So I mentioned previously that Leptocollis hybridizes with uh, nine other species within this group. Generally, Leptocollis has this, um, it flowers at, in the evenings. It has this yellow, very typical flower. Um, these hybrids, uh, extremely easy to tell, especially if you have an entity that the stems look like leptocollis, but then you get a pink flower, for example, when you're expecting yellow. Um, so I guess all I want to say there is morphology has been useful to distinguish um, hybrids and cytotypes in previous groups. Um, again, going off the NC2 measurements, so in the wild, I had a great field crew. So here in the middle, Emma was with me for both seasons of this pandemic field sampling. Um, but luckily I also had Stephen Cassidy here on the left and then Raquel Garcia on the right join me on that second field season. And so there as cacti, as succulents, right? There are some characters such as general width, um, maybe even spine length on some of these that when you press them as a herbarium specimen and you're looking at these herbarium specimens flattened, you really just don't get representative view of the morphology of this group. Um, and again, what I'm really focused on here is this population level morphometric data, which has yet to been um, completed for this species in particular. But Mark Baker, again, um, he's been focusing a lot on Choya morphometrics. Um, part of the issue of why it hasn't been completed in this group before is that this species in particular is so morphologically variable. So it, for example, when you look at the diploid here on the left in purple, uh, the triploids in the middle, orange, and then you have the tetraploids here on the right, um, just based on looking at them, there are no immediate <laughs> jumping out characters that one is different than the other. So for example, if you wanna look at spine length in the diploids, you oftentimes will see long spines. Um, and then in the tetraploids, you also see these long spines. Um, but also in the tetraploids and adults, you might see short spines or no spines. Um, it's really, this project has become trying to find characters that are useful for these on the ground species delimitations. Um, and in particular, this tet or triploid, which I might not have mentioned earlier, but um, triploids in particular are somewhat problematic. They possess this problem where it's really difficult reproductively for them to complete meiosis on their own. So generally, there's a rule of even numbered ploides um, might be more reproductively isolated, to say the least. So when you have these triploids, you really need either another triploid to mate with in that population, or else you're gonna go extinct. Um, or you might be able to contribute two thirds of your genome, whereas a, a diploid might be able to contribute one third to make a triploid. So there's all sorts of combinations that you can have here uh, to make a polyploid, but the triploids on their own won't reproduce unless they have another event um, or another individual in the population to reproduce with. So again, um, before we were looking at vegetative characters, when you look at these reproductive characters, for example, with this, uh, we have a diploid on the left again, your triploid 
um, in the middle here, producing flowers. Uh, it, on all accounts, this triploid here is producing mature pollen. The, um, this might not be a good picture because I think this was taken right at anthesis around like 7 p.m. But the stigma will open very soon after. It's very much contributing pollen and likely receiving um, pollen on the stigma here. Uh, from our first field season, Emma and I were traveling around Texas and sometimes uh, visiting populations around 11 a.m. This picture in the bottom really emphasizes um, this difference and possibly um, differences in flowering time um, of what parts of the flower are actually maturing at different times. So again, this plant on the bottom, it was around 11 a.m. Leptocallus normally um, will open its flowers around 7 p.m. So this flower was open. The stigma was awaiting to receive pollen, but you'll notice here the anthers are tightly packed around the stigma and they were not mature at 11 a.m. in this trip or a tetraploid individual. So it's really just an observation at this point. Um, but what I've done a little bit of research on since then is take iNaturalist data. I was trying to look at the phenology times um, from when basically the stigma um, and the stamen were mature and try and really see if there's possible phenological differences. Um, it's hard to obviously to tell what ploidy it is, but possibly if we know that the tetraploids occur only in certain extents of the range, for example, the Great Plains and the Chihuahuan Desert, um, but we don't see any phenological differences in the diploid and that Sonoran Desert. Um, maybe it's something worth considering and we can leverage iNaturalist data to do. So the next morphological point um, that I wanna emphasize here, so this is the work with Raquel Garcia. So Raquel was an undergraduate um, with me. She received funding from the Florida Museum of Natural History to complete her work. She's recently graduated, um, but I'm just gonna emphasize a little of the work that we've been doing with the stomata size and density to try and distinguish polyploids. And so obviously Raquel on the left, um, but here on the top right. So we were using population level sampling for this. We also were testing to see if we could tell if ploidy differed among herbarium specimens, but I'm only going to present on the work here that we um, found with the population level sampling. So it's a subset of the populations that you saw on that first map here, but we have some diploids and then mixed ploidy populations of diploids, triploids here represented by the diamonds, whether it's purple for diploid and then the mixed ploidy populations is pink. So note again, Great Plains Chihuahuan Desert, I'm considering um, basically like Texas. We included in this preliminary analysis um, a population right in the middle here where it starts to bow in between the Snorn Desert. Um, it's currently counted as a diploid, but I've also recently counted triploids. So this has been somewhat updated. Um, but oftentimes here in the Snorn Desert, we're finding a lot of triploids appearing. So the really key mechanism here from the cytogeographic data um, and these chromosome counts, there are <laughs> seemingly a decent amount of triploids appearing within these populations. So the general amount of abundance that triploids are occurring in these populations is still to be determined, um, but this is generally pretty uncommon for plants to have. Um, and I also mentioned this at the very beginning of my talk, but this is likely contributed to their clonality. So Leptocallus, the stem will pop off, and as soon as it hits the soil, it'll start putting down roots within a couple of days, maybe, or as soon as it gets rain. So it's highly clonal, um, which allows its triploids to kind of hang around for a while and maybe wait out um, for other triploids to appear to mate with, or maybe it will have some reproductive barriers um, diminished with the diploids it occurs with or the tetraploids. So Raquel, some of these key findings from the stromatal data. So what Raquel did 
is she took images at both 400x and 100x on um, her microscopes here. And she was measuring density and also measuring somatic length, width, and area. So this first slide here is showing the density measurements. So she took um, five images per individual at 400x and then measure or counted all of the stomata within that image. And then we averaged that um, across individuals. And so the key takeaway here is that um, when you're looking across ploidy, so this is generally, um, it, it's including anything we have a direct count on. So this has no flow cytometry data in the morphological samples here. So we tend to observe a higher density, stromatal density in the diploids when comparing that with the triploids and tetraploids. We also note if we're trying to find trends, maybe you know, thinking about if latitude has any effect or elevation um, of where these occur have any effect, there's this decreasing trend for density um, across latitudes and elevations for the tetraploids. But you tend to see this general increase, um, more so represented in this elevation, right? And with this high correlation of 0.72 across these diploid populations. Um, I'm going to get more into this, I believe, in the next two slides, but here, let me go back. Um, I want to note that the diploids, again, occur within the Snore and the Chihuahuan Desert and the Great Plains. So you really have this elevation gradient. Um, and the diploids that you might not be seeing as much of an effect from in the triploids here. So when we are looking at stromatal length, width, and area, we tend to see um, smaller width, length, and area of the diploids when compared to their triploid and tetraploid individuals. Um, this is not a complete surprise by any means. So when you have a tetraploid, for example, or you have something greater than a diploid, you have more genetic content in that cell. And so large, <laughs> the reason that we're using stomata uh, cells in general is that we need some sort of proxy for cell size, right? So if we have double the amount of DNA, for example, in our cell, we should be able to see that in any other cell. So larger cells represented by this tetraploid um, by length, width, and area. And I will say, since these are CAM plants, they're doing photosynthesis at night. Um, all of these were taken during the day. So hopefully we're not seeing these um, kind of stochastic events uh, for width. But when I'm talking about this, generally length is the most reliable measurement I'm going to show you here for um, our stomata. And so when we have decompressed this information, um, let me go back. Uh, in these images I was previously showing you, these are including all of the individuals from all populations that have counts to them. But if we look at just the populations, and just to reemphasize that there's a notable, uh, noticeable difference between the diploids um, from the Snorn and Chihuahuan Desert. So if you look to the left here, um, populations BAZ 29 um, to 44 in general. These are all Texas populations. And then everything um, from 58 on, so about halfway through this graph here, um, that is all Snorn Desert. So we generally see the diploids differing, being much smaller um, in these Texas populations than possibly um, whether it's density. Um, than the uh, Chihuahuan Desert, or sorry, Snoran Desert here on the right. So we might want to think about this as a drought resistance mechanism. That's probably the best way to explain it. So if you are occupying, for example, if we're looking at length, um, we probably want smaller cells, um, for example, in the Snoran Desert um, and Chihuahuan Desert to an extent to kind of reduce this evapotranspiration, right? Um, so we would expect in the Great Plains where drought isn't as much of a problem to possibly have these larger cells. 
And that also might be why we only see the tetraploids occurring in the Chihuahuan um, and also the Great Plains primarily. Uh, we also did a few regressions here, uh, just again looking at latitude and elevation for these preliminary results. And we tend to see these um, smaller length width and area of the diploids when compared to the triploids um, and tetraploids. We also generally see this negative effect when you are increasing in your width or length um, or area. I'm only including width and area in these images. Um, but as elevation increases, you get smaller cells, which is also as we expect. Um, this is not in the title of my talk, but I wanted to include just a few preliminary um, analyses regarding ecological breadth. So when whole genome duplication occurs, this can uh, affect developmental processes such as gene regulation, um, leading to this morphological, physiological, or ecological breadth. Um, here on the left, I'm showing you, just in general, I'm using level one ecoregions. And of course, I'm trying to use the same ploidy um, categories here. So purple, you'll see diploid again occurring across the entire range. You have your triploids occurring here. Um, this data in particular is from my first field season with Emma. And then we have these tetraploids exclusively occurring in the Chihuahuan deserts and Great Plains. Um, so the goal is, is to be able to get enough data if we can to describe, you know, move forward, um, or move back. The goal is to get enough data on the ploidal level to be able to um, model ecological niches. Um, and again, these whole genome duplication events can lead to species range expansions, as we've seen before. Um, but really, we want to know, does ecological breadth vary among ploidy? And are there any particular climatic uh, variables influencing the separation? So what exactly is keeping these tetraploids um, from entering the Sonoran Desert, for example? And so the goal here is to hopefully utilize um, and leverage these multivariate analyses, maybe PCAs if we can, uh, univariate analyses of just the climatic variables. Um, and then also if we can get enough data at the ploidal level to implement uh, niche models, um, that would be the dream by the end of this project. And again, um, when you're modeling and using niche modeling, um, to model cytotype suitability, ideally you need enough data for these models. If you don't have, let's say 20 or more points um, per cytotype, it's really not worth modeling. You're not gonna get a reliable model. So I'm hoping that I can at least gain enough data to be able to do this to complement that population genetics aspect. Um, but what I have here, um, these were very preliminary models. The base layer is showing the current suitability using all of the occurrence points possible. So this is over about, I think, 2,000 points, um, little gray dots. Um, this suitability model is omitting any ploidy data. So this is generally the current suitability of the species with um, the cytotypes laid over top. So you have red, um, highly suitable environments, and then the blue being low suitability, right? So they can live there, but they're likely not gonna be there, whether that's using um, precipitation or climatic, or uh, precipitation or, um, oh my gosh, temperature variables. We can also um, utilize niche modeling um, for the entire distribution of the species. So using all those gray dots, to model into the past, which is something I've been doing. So looking at the mid Holocene, for example, on this top left panel, 6,000 years ago, um, we see a little bit difference. I wish I would have kind of put this previous model here. It's not completely different than um, what we currently see. So very similar. But if you look at this last glacial maximum panel in the top right, 22,000 years ago, 
That's what I really want to note. So the tribe Slenderpuntia um, in the Sapuntioidi group was found to have diverged around the mid Miocene. So we're talking anywhere from about 15 to 21 million years ago. So this is around the time the group diverged. And previous work by uh, Lucas Major 2019 here cited um, shows, oh no, it cuts off Leptocallus, but Leptocallus is sister to everything else in this group. Um, so likely diverged um, with the most recent common ancestor to the rest of the group. So if we model this particular species, we notice some really cool results here that uh, I wasn't particularly expecting. Um, we have these hot spots here in Central America. And also um, a big biogeographic question in the past has been, how has cacti um, arrived uh, in these islands, right? Um, I'm not gonna go into more detail. This is purely speculation here based on this niche modeling, um, but this might be a, primary, uh, a promising result to kind of look into to possibly explain that there might've been um, a movement out of South America, up Central America, and maybe a jump here um, from Central America over rather than coming from South America and up. Um, so somewhat contentious, but based on just the modeling of climate, we tend to see these results that maybe we weren't expecting to see. Um, based on preliminary multivariate analyses here using climatic variables, um, so we have temperature represented in the red over here on the right. Um, what we're hoping to see here are the populations separated um, <laughs> based on ploidy. However, you'll note that there are certain populations on this graph that are more separated than others. Um, if you look here, so the further separated it is, um, and the larger the arrow pointing to that, the larger contribution that particular climatic variable has um, kind of uh, separating out this niche in a sense, to say the least. Um, I also have in the blue over here, precipitation variables. I will note this is very preliminary um, and this does not, when you usually run these analyses, what you wanna do is run it and then you wanna remove um, variables that are kind of giving you redundant there, uh, data. This multicollinearity is what we call it. So this is very preliminary, just showing, yes, we have ploides, um, whether it's diploids having different niche space uh, than other diploids, maybe tetraploids in the same boat, um, triploids possibly occupying separate uh, niche space. It's really this, take this figure with a grain of salt, I guess is where I'll leave it. Um, I've also run some preliminary univariate analyses here. Um, and again, this analysis in particular was ran before any field work happened. So this is taking all of our bioclimatic data. So we have 19 total variables. I've only put up four here um, that were particularly interesting. So we're hoping with these types of analyses to see um, the diploids, for example, and precipitation seasonality. All this means is how much precipitation is varying from season to season, right? So we might have um, a great variation um, with diploids being represented again, occupying several deserts um, and habitats. Um, our triploids might be prone to popping up in um, certain seasonality conditions. And then the tetraploids occupying um, a possible niche space here. Um, again, mean temperature of the driest quarter, so hottest time of the year, or driest time of the year, I should say, um, coldest time of the year in the bottom left, and then um, possible effects of evapotranspiration. So again, purely speculation until I can get all of the data for ploidy uh, put into these. But uh, future considerations, uh, when I originally did this analysis, I was only finding triploids in the Sonoran Desert, but since this analysis has been ran, we now have triploids popping up in both desert types um, and also in the Great Plains. So really we should be thinking about, should we be separating uh, these groups into mixed ploides or should we be looking at the data altogether as 
triploids um, in the Sonoran Desert versus the Chihuahuan Desert, for example. So these are future considerations. And I am gonna end my talk here based on what I've been focusing most of my time in the last few months. So population genetics, which is really, I mean, it's a passion of mine. It's something uh, that I consider a primary focus of this work. Um, I'm hoping that this will elucidate these fine scale patterns um, of gene flow and genetic differentia uh, differentiation and in inbreeding um, of these cytotypes. So this type of work has not been previously um, accomplished in the genus Cylinderpuntia. Um, we've seen a couple uh, population genetic projects in Apuntia and of course across, uh, across Cactaceae, but again in this genus, very novel. Um, population genetics in general is very ideal for these, uh, what we're calling neopolyploids. So these really nascent new um, polyploid events and for investigating other potential factors um, that really might be contributing to this differentiation and long uh, lived and giant breadth of this particular species. And so we've seen um, gene flow be particularly important, especially for cytotypes and speciation mechanisms in columnar cacti previously. Um, and this is generally because we see natural selection favoring uh, colonization of these long dispersed individuals into new environments. Um, we also see um, lack of gene flow and inbreeding and vicariance events um, in groups of cactus, so such as mellow cactus. So not in um, Apuntioide, but uh, these other, um, probably what you think of more typical cacti. Um, with these smaller distributions and higher habitat specificity. So really we're asking uh, questions of what on a population level, what are these plants doing? Are they breeding with each other? Is this affecting their uh, niche space and distribution? Is this making them more specific to their habitats? Are they able to occupy new um, niche space based on genetics? Um, and we also, Again, I'm really interested in the effects of clonality. And so you're gonna see here in this next slide that I'm gonna show you, um, for this work, I'm going to use microsatellite um, repeats. And so generally in our field, population genetics is moving towards whole, um, our next generation sequencing techniques. Microsatellites has been kind of considered somewhat outdated, et cetera. But really what this is gonna be able to show us is this um, fine scale clonality effects. So with this next generation sequencing, we wouldn't be able to see much of the clonality um, on this population level for the cost that I need it to be. And so just to emphasize um, what the research aims are, with this population genetic data, I'm hoping to quantify genetic diversity within and among um, cytotypes or ploidal levels. We wanna try and quantify this extent of clonality within populations. And how does that differ between ploidal levels, for example? Are triploids, or sorry, are diploids uh, more prone? Um, are they more clonal? Is that leading to more triploids, for example? Um, are there certain populations where we're seeing diploids and tetraploids. I have not yet seen any encounters of this, um, but really we're looking for evidence of um, basically how many times has this formed and what mechanism is this forming from. So again, we're using what's called uh, microsatellite methods. And at this point, the current progress, I have went ahead and designed um, primers for this. And so this is using two different species, but I've also used Leptocollis alone. Um, and by using two different species, what I'm hoping to do is try and design primers that we can look at population level effects across uh, different species, especially with Leptocollis that hybridizes frequently with other species of this genus. So really what we're looking for here is we're hoping that this microsatellite um, analysis, we can find primers to use um, across populations, across species, um, across ploidy, um, but basically the progress of this part of it is um, 
I'm currently extracting the DNA and testing the primers. So I, that's really all the data I have for you on that aspect of the project. Um, but hopefully in the next six months or so, we'll have some really cool um, results for you. And if you follow my Twitter, I'll try and post some there. So I wanna end this talk, which I think is reasonably on time. I wanna thank um, several key characters. Again, Mark Baker, who has been really influential um, in collecting the data, finding populations, sending me plants, everything I need to know about chromosome counts. I can't thank Mark enough for everything he's done. I also can't thank Emma enough for joining me in these two field seasons, um, collecting samples, just generally being the person I can go to about my project. Again, I wanna thank uh, Raquel Garcia, the undergraduate funded by the Florida Museum of Natural History um, for really working hard on the stomata and morphological differences of the species. Um, again, I wanna thank Stephen Cassidy joining me in the field, um, especially, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but my second field season getting COVID. Uh, this field team in particular, Emma, Raquel, Steve, uh, really were key in helping me get through that 2021 field season. I also want to thank Taylor Bassett for all of his work, um, helping me pot samples, bringing them back to the house, um, dealing with all of this pandemic issues and really trying to offer support when necessary and when I have nobody else to go to. And I, I lastly want to thank all the funding agencies who have made all of this work possible. Um, Tori Botanical Society, obviously, for inviting me for this talk, funding this research, and really believing in the goal that I had um, and how important this work is. Um, also, American Society of Plant Taxonomists, Cactus and Succulent Society, Society of Systematic Bi uh, Biologists, the University Department of uh, University of Florida Department of Biology, and Florida Museum of Natural History as well. And with that, I think I'm ready to take questions. If Lydia. Mm -hmm has any for me here. I don't know if I should stop sharing my screen. Uh, whatever you prefer. Uh, I'll leave it up for now, just in case, maybe, but. Well, thank you so much for this talk. Um, it's interesting to see some results that you get that you're, you expected to get those results and you're kind of like, you know, you're like, okay, I'm on the right track. I'm doing something right. And then other results where it's, you know, maybe a bit of a mess and you have to kind of look at it from a different angle or, or remove some kind of variable to kind of see. And that's, I guess, the, the whole process uh, as it goes. So. Yeah, it's definitely been a, a whirlwind of at least two years of doing field work and really trying to figure out how to collect data. Uh, why you can't get to campus <laughs> while machines are down. Yeah, and I mean, that's a great like setup to have, to, have, to be able to have like, you know, a microscope and to be setting up these kind of things at home. Like that's, yeah, I'm sure that was a really good, you know, relief to be able to do that. Um, so if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in. I know I have, a, I have one or two in the meantime. Um, so, Okay, for I'll ask the um, the methodological kind of question first. I'm interested about when you to do the kind of um, the chromosome counts. What exactly does that involve? Like, what do you, do you have to you have to make sections? How you know how easy is it to be able to see the chromosomes? Yeah, right. Yeah, that's a great question. Oftentimes in these talks, um, you know, it's really important detail that you, you oftentimes don't have a lot of time to really emphasize how difficult and fine <laughs> tuning of a skill this is. So essentially what you have to do, um, so these pictures best represent it. Um, what you have to do around midday is go out to these plants. You water them a day or two before for cacti in particular. Um, you're hoping to, in these particular counts, um, get what we call mitotic counts. So you will turn the plant over in its pot You'll take the pot up and you'll try and collect these new roots. I also think I have one more picture here of it. So if you look here, I've turned over a pot um, in this second to left image. And what we're looking for here is this new root growth. So we're hoping that mitosis is occurring there. So essentially I'll take that off. I'll run it through a couple of chemicals and then I'll mount that on a slide 
um, and then give it a dye. So I've dyed all of these here and you can kind of even see in these images I've included here, the little X's of what we hope to see um, in these certain phases of mitosis. So essentially once we dye it, we count the number of X's we see. Um, and yeah, that's, that's basically, it's uh, about eight to 10 hours of changing it from chemical to chemical and then maybe an hour per slide um, per individual of trying to really get these good pictures um, and counts from it. Uh, and that's for somebody who's bad at it. <laughs> so, for me, maybe, I don't know, at the beginning. And do you have like, uh, I guess you have like a camera mounted on the, well, so that probably also helps with like your eyes because I know when I, I did a lab once for this in my master's and we were all like, we had terrible headaches at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah, you know, at the beginning of my PhD, I had 2020, and uh, at this point, I have my knee glasses, <laughs> but, but that's likely just from too much time under the microscope. I do have a camera attached, um, but I didn't get that until the maybe the second field season. So a lot of these images here on this were actually just using my iPhone on the camera lens or on the. Oh, well, that's a skill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. Props to you for that. Um, cool. Um, okay, so then speaking of this kind of polity stuff, I'm trying to think about, okay, the triploids, I would, I guess, okay, I was thinking maybe triploids in some uh, species can form when you have a diploid and a, a tetraploid that will, um, have, you know, will have offspring, but that doesn't seem to be the case here that you're not really finding those two populations together. So is this more of kind of like an incomplete, right? some kind of incomplete meiosis? What could be the kind of Yeah, so mechanism? generally um, when we see these diploids and tetraploids coming together, um, oftentimes that's an allopolyploidy event for two different species, right? So the fact that we're seeing so many triploids occurring within, um, for example, we see a lot of triploids occurring within diploid populations on the Sonoran part of the range. Um, and then, oh gosh, maybe I should have gone to this. I don't know where it was, current status, when it was through. Um, but we see a lot of triploids occurring within these tetraploid populations too. I've only really found one population where it's solely triploid. Um, but that's again off limited data. Um, what I think is happening is that these are um, auto polyploids, which is making it really hard to differ uh, differentiate morphologically, right? Um, but also, white, we might be seeing maybe a tetraploid uh, producing a triploid that occurs, or maybe a diploid um, meeting with a diploid that's uh, giving a triploid. So that could be one of the reasons, um, but it's really difficult. And I don't know if we're really gonna be able to make this solid conclusion using the microsatellite data. So I don't wanna overstretch that, but I guess that's purely speculation on the mechanism of ploidy. And then, I mean, that makes me think, I wonder how many other, like within Cactaceae, but also outside that they will have these like unknown, if you know, like allopoly or autopolyploid um, right. things going on that, yeah. and I, I, you know, and I think that I feel like this kind of work was maybe, is maybe being done a lot less now that people are focusing more on molecular stuff, um, that, yeah. you know, there's still lots and lots of, you know, more kind of like classical techniques that can, or the same thing with kind of looking at the stomata, um, there's like a really a lot going on in these that is yeah. worth I mean, it's really important, right, for these species boundary questions. And it's really the question of if they're auto polyploids and they look similar to their diploid progeners, should we consider that a species? Um, if so, how do we differentiate them if they're not contributing back to the genome? It's, it's really, um, this is going to be a really important system, I think, for future work. Um, something that definitely has not been considered especially in Cactaceae, um, contributing to a lot of, whether it's species boundaries, differences in niche space. Um, yeah, 
I think it's polyploids in particular should be really analyzed further. And um, it's really just going to take a lot of people looking at population level data, um, which is also part of the problem. And a lot of people are looking at poi across these wide, broad distributions. Um, and so you start looking at this fine scale effect and looking at how these populations are maintained. I think that's where the really cool stuff is going to be. Um, in the next couple of years, at least for this project. Cool. Uh, we do have a question that I got from Emma uh, about the pollen. So you were able to collect the flowers, you guys are able to collect flowers in the field. So could the, the pollen characteristics possibly uh, give you some more morphological characters? Yeah, let me go back here. Um, I've done a few studies here um, using the issue being last field season, um, when we really started looking at uh, maybe the contribution of pollen. Um, when you have these triploids, sometimes the pollen, if you use a stain, um, it will tell you if it's triploid or if it's a diploid um, based on the maturity of the pollen, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what we hope to do um, and what Mark Baker has kind of started doing in these mixed ploidy populations is he'll take some pollen He'll stain it, and then he'll make an assumption of that individual, um, assuming it's at full anthesis. Um, is the pollen actually <laughs> reproductively contributing um, to these ploidal level populations? Um, so there's been a little bit of work, but again, in this last field season, we were going in August, and there were not as many um, plants flowering as we would have hoped. So there were a couple of populations that had them, um, but any hope of really using, uh, taking flowers from individuals in the field, maybe putting them in alcohol, um, looking at the pollen or looking at the, oops, uh, um, looking at the floral characteristics uh, has somewhat been hindered by the time of collection. <laughs> so it's definitely an avenue that's worth pursuing for possible uh, delimitation of ploidy. Uh, I just thought of another thing too. Um, is there any way that you can use um, like herbarium specimens for any of this work? I don't know how well the, cause I know like, okay, for like uh, sequencing that some of the, you know, the older the specimen or the method of preservation, it might not be good, but I don't know how that translates into like the chromosome, you know, yeah. visualization. Yeah, another great question. So this is kind of multifaceted. So the uh, microsatellite primers I originally developed um, I was hoping to use diploid and tetraploids to develop these primers in hopes that we could maybe look at the number of alleles that show up. Um, maybe we see two peaks for a diploid and four peaks. Um, basically use our genetic data to uh, delimit ploidy. But we've also, in terms of using herbarium specimens, maybe for pollen sustainability, that might be promising. Um, Raquel in particular here, Mm -hmm. um, part of her original funding was actually to, um, I was particularly interested in the population level effects here, but I also had her image um, herbarium specimens. So all of the vouchers we collected in the field to deposit, she took stomatal peels from. So um, to hopefully look at that, but we haven't fully analyzed the data of herbarium specimens there. But if we can see differences within ploidy or among ploidy, I should say, um, of these herbarium specimens. Hopefully we could go take a, a peel, we take nail polish, paint it on there, peel it off. Um, and that would be a great measure to try and get at the cytotypes across, especially in areas like in Mexico, for example. Um, it's promising. So we hope to analyze that further, I guess is where that's at too. Oh, and that's a cool like method for the to so look at the stomata instead of having to kind of like, I guess, process and potentially end up destroying the actual tissue that you can just do that kind of peel, like a negative ice. I don't think I emphasized how cool that was of what she was doing. So these photos that I was showing you here, that's all clear nail polish where she basically peeled these off and put them under a microscope. So at the top there and then under 400 X here. So that's it's very, very non-destructive. You still need in herbarium cases uh, permission to do this, but um, 
we were hoping that we would be able to find some sort of method um, that's been shown to work in Opuntia, for example, um, for just delimiting cytotypes. Um, so you go into the field and you need to know if something looks the same, can we get a proxy kind of, are these cells much larger in the triploids maybe than the diploids? Um, I don't think we have enough data to really throw out a conclusion, unfortunately. So. It's also a fun like project to do as an undergrad to kind of have to kind of start you off on your. Yeah, yeah your I have classes too. By the end. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of time and effort on Raquel's part. So huge thank you to her for putting in all of that. Nice. And I'm now I'm now I'm thinking about we have a we have a Apuntia that's native to New York that's Apuntia humifusa. Um, so I wonder if again there's the same kind of stuff going on there. We actually have a couple patches that we have in the botanical garden. I wonder what their point is. Yeah, you know, sometimes depending on who collected it, um, they might be able to tell you what Floydia was, um, especially if it's Mark Baker. Lucas Majeure, for example, did a lot of counts um, in the floidal distribution cytotypes. So really, sometimes it either might be on the herbarium specimens, um, or you might be able to just get information whether uh, it might be an allopolypoidy cross. Uh, it's definitely worth a project um, pursuing it further. So in Apuntia in particular, like I said, it's been, there's a couple of papers out there um, that show differences in cytotype size, uh, stromatal size, so mm -hmm. promising. That could be especially a good thing if we have some, you know, like this, under, if we get a lot of undergrad interns and stuff that comes, that could be a- It's a uh, easy, yes. fast technique, <laughs> as long as they don't mind losing their eyesight. Well, uh, anyone has any last minute speak now or best or forever hold your peace? Um, but otherwise, thank you again, Bethany, for, for giving this talk. I'm really glad also that, you know, one of the other, you know, great things about the Tory Society is having all of these kind of um, fellowships to support researchers at different levels. And like, this is exactly the kind of thing that we want to be doing is like helping people to really like get, get stuff done and, and, you know, provide, because funding is like, one of the most, you know, important things, uh, you know, moral support and, 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 you know, listening to you is, is great, but like the money is really what helps to get, you know, more samples and more different analyses and all that kind of stuff. So happy yeah. to be able to contribute to that. Yeah. I wouldn't have been able to do any of this without Tori or any of these other societies. So it's really critical to myself, the knowledge of the field. And thank you guys enough for every opportunity you've given me. So, and thanks everyone for coming and sticking around. Um, in a related to this pollen question that we had next month, our talk is actually going to be about the uh, the vi the virome of pollen. So, what kinds of things pollen is carrying on it, uh, which I think will be very interesting. Um, so, uh, Bethany, hope that you stay dry down there in Florida with the hurricane uh, and I'm sure we'll get, well, maybe not, but if it doesn't veer off into the ocean, maybe we'll get a rainstorm in a, you know, a little while too. Yeah, <laughs> but, thank you so much. Yes. All right, everybody have a good night and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you, take care.